Welcome everybody. We thank you for coming out this Monday afternoon here in Henrietta. And on behalf of the Henrietta Chamber of Commerce, I want to say thank you for showing up and having something to eat with us. We had our board meeting earlier, so we want to say thank you to Shoney's for catering this for us. Give them a big round of applause. At this time, I'd like to introduce our Attorney General of the State of Oklahoma. Gittner Drummond was sworn in as Oklahoma's 19th Attorney General on January 9th, 2023. Gittner's law experience spans nearly 30 years and includes having served as an Assistant District Attorney in Pawnee and Osage Counties, and as an attorney in private practice as well. In 1999, he founded the Tulsa-based firm Drummond Law. In addition to his legal career, Gittner, a seventh-generation Oklahoman, has been a longtime rancher, banker, and businessman. A U.S. Air Force jet pilot during the Persian Gulf War, Gittner led the first combat mission of the conflict, one of the most decorated Oklahomans to serve in the Gulf War. He was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for extraordinary achievement, as well as three air medals and four aerial achievement medals. He earned his bachelor's degree from Oklahoma State University and his law degree from Georgetown University. Gittner and his wife, Wendy, have been married 12 years and have a blended family of six children and five grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for Attorney General Gittner Drummond. Um, appreciate the introduction, and I, I truly appreciate this audience. I know we've got chamber, we've got business leaders, we also have first responders. And, uh, and, and, I, and I appreciate, I, I tell you, I, I get to speak across the state um, weekly, and the reputation that Okmulgee County has and the city of Henrietta, relative to other communities of your size, uh, you, you are heads and shoulders above. So do the chief and the mayor and, and the, law, uh, the fire department, and our sheriff and deputies, uh, you guys do, do it great. And IMSA and, and, and uh, the first responders of, of Okmulgee County. Uh, the, the objective that uh, these listening tours we have, we're, we're, we're trying to get out <clears throat> to as many meaningful communities as possible around the state during the summer for two reasons. One, to kind of give you a, an insight into what is important in the state of Oklahoma from the Attorney General's perspective. But equally of importance is for me to listen and hear from you the issues and complaints that you have and, and areas that we may be just tone deaf or myopic at a state level so that uh, we can do that. I did enjoy getting to visit with a lot of your first responders uh, before we, we began, and, and those issues I'll address here briefly, but they're, they're meaningful and impactful to Okmulgee County. Um, <clears throat> so 59 years old, they've had a really successful uh, non-elected career, and uh, when I fired myself from seven companies at the end of uh, December 2022 to take this position, uh, I had about 900 employees in 14 states, and banking, law, ranching, abstracting, and the like. I really feel like I have a pretty broad exposure on the business side, which is why I'm always attracted to speak to chambers, and then on the, the law enforcement side from the background as a prosecutor. And now as, as one of the only uh, clean, administratively certified AGs we've ever had in the state, I'm, I'm proud to be uh, part of the first responder team and take that important. Um, one. One uh, eighth of my tenure behind me now, six months, and we've got three and a half years left. But I count each week um, covetously because we have to continue to advance the ball. We have a lot of issues in Oklahoma that need to be addressed by an independently elected uh, attorney general who puts the rule of law first. And, and it, not one day goes by that I don't remind myself who my client is as your chief lawyer and it's the citizens of Oklahoma, not the political elite, not the statewide elected officers, not the legislature, judiciary, or administration, but the, but the voters. And that's why I want to be here, and I want to be heard by you uh, and, and be responsive. I want to address three big rocks that are important uh, to my office. They were important during the campaign. They continue to be important. Um, Frankly, the, the biggest and most significant impact in the state of Oklahoma that I believe is statewide because it reverberates across eastern Oklahoma to western, and that's the disconnect between the Native American tribes and the state of Oklahoma. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it is not lost on me the challenges that you have had in Okmulgee County and in general and Henrietta in specific 
uh, with the, the ramifications of McGirt. When I speak in a lot of communities and I say McGirt, a lot of people look at me like, what do you mean? And I don't think that's the case here, but for those who might live in a, under a rock, in 2018, the Supreme Court decided that uh, the five tribes, uh, Seminole Creek, Chickasaw, Chickasaw Choctaw, and Cherokee, um, had certain treaty rights that had been ignored by the state of Oklahoma. Now, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm a hominy native, right? That's where I woke up this morning. Uh, I try to spend as many nights here as I can. Unfortunately, I'm five nights a week in Oklahoma City, which I hate. Um, and so I grew up in Osage County, and in October, Killers of the Flower Moon is going to come out. That's Martin Scorsese. And, you know, it, it was, as, a, as a boy whose great-grandfather sat between the, the federal agent and the chief and translated as the 2,229 Osages took their head right a lot, but um, my family has been integrated with the Osage Nation forever, since 1890, although I'm not native. <clears throat> we screwed up somewhere along the line. We should have married into the tribe and had some privileges, but we, we didn't. Uh, but the Killers of the Flower Moon was the genesis of the FBI because we in Osage County were not prosecuting aggressively whites who were committing crimes against natives. And uh, up comes FBI, up comes some treaty language, and it was called out back in the 1920s, but we didn't do anything about it. And then all of a sudden we have now McGirt that says, Native Americans are gonna be prosecuted by either their tribe, tribal prosecution, if it's a misdemeanor or a minor felony, or by the federal government if it's a major crime. And that's where we are. And then uh, my city administrators are, are keen to this. About three weeks ago, the 10th Circuit uh, ruled in the Hooper case that even municipalities don't have ticketing rights over Native Americans. And I share the frustration of our law enforcement because it is almost as though, that I've had sh several sheriffs and, and chiefs of police say, I mean, I just want to throw my hands up, Drummond, I'm done. I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, we expend a lot of resources stopping people, and, and yet we can't ticket them. And if we ticket them, then I get dismissed. And so I, that, that frustration is not lost on me. Um, unfortunately, here's where we are. The federal Senate and House will not pass a law to fix our problem. The likelihood of the Supreme Court waking up tomorrow going, oh, we're so sorry, we got it wrong and reverse themselves is highly unlikely. It may happen in 50 years, like Plessy versus Ferguson or like Roe v. Wade, but it ain't gonna happen while most of us are in our professional careers. And instead, both of those, the judiciary and the legislature are saying, hey, Oklahoma, figure it out. And so I will tell this audience, and I mean it with all due, with 100% commitment, under these next three and a half years, I am absolutely committed to finding a solution that acknowledges the sovereignty of the tribes, recognizes the need for law enforcement, such that we make sure lawbreakers, regardless of your heritage or your political affiliation, are prosecuted. And law-abiding people are protected. And that just has to be the case. I will tell you, uh, to this audience, I've spent almost 120 hours of negotiations with tribal entities, to include the Muscogee Creeks. The Muscogee Creeks are different. It's a different tribe. Each tribe is unique. There's 39 of them. <clears throat> it would be like saying France and Germany are the same. And then they're not, right? You know they're different uh, sovereigns. And so we have 39 sovereigns. I've met with almost all of them several times right here in Okmulgee with the, with the tribal council and the chief. And the ability to enter into an agreement for the Chickasaws is much easier. They have a benevolent dictator called Governor Anatabi who basically speaks for the tribe. And if he says, Drummond, we're gonna get an agreement, you know what, we're gonna get an agreement. So the state of Oklahoma with the Chickasaws will probably have an intergovernmental agreement in the next year, followed shortly thereafter with the Cherokees. They're gonna probably enter into an agreement. Then the Choctaws will follow after about six months to a year of that working. It will take a couple of years for the other tribes to have this work for the for the Muscogee Creeks to be able to come along. Um, there's some very strong emotions inside that tribal council 
And their government is set up differently than the other tribes, such that Chief David Hill is, and uh, I, I believe with all my heart that he wants a solution. Um, but his tribal council, some of those members don't want a solution. And if you want any personal testimony, you can talk to the chief of the Henrietta Police or the Sheriff of Okmulgee County and look those men in the eyes and they know that there is a disconnect. And so I will do all that I can uh, to find a solution and be that arbiter as, uh, as the one who wants an agreement such that the 400,000 Native Americans that live in Oklahoma are Oklahomans. And the tribal leaders of all 39 tribes want bad people in jail and good people protected. And that's what you want and that's what I want. And so we're gonna to have to work hard. And to that end, I have to ask for you to be patient and work with me. And it will be clunky and rough and misstarts and failures, but at the end, we're all Oklahomans about to figure this out. So that's very important to me. Another very important issue for the Attorney General's office is <clears throat> the fallout of passing the medical marijuana and failing to properly oversee and organize and promulgate rules that contained the production of marijuana. Um, a year ago, we had just over 12,000 grow operations. Today, we have 6,299. Our legislature has identified, hey, we got a problem. Uh, and I've been an advocate for a solution. And the solutions that we've offered and they've passed is, now the Attorney General and his staff has the authority to go into any grow operation and require production of a, a license, and we have the ability to pierce the veil of the LLCs and the S-Corps and the C-Corps all the way up to what we have air-breathing humans that own the entities. Because right now they've got shell by shell by shell by shell. And of the 6,299, our intel indicates that a little over 3,000 of those are probably illegal. And, uh, you know, with all the things on the plate of your sheriff and your police chief, they need a partner. And the partner is the Attorney General's office. We are standing up an organized crime task force to collaborate with sheriffs and, and police chiefs, as well as OBN and OMMA, uh, to eradicate the criminal element among us. I'm a grandfather. I have five grandchildren. <clears throat> as was announced, I mean, I'm a seventh-generation Oklahoma. We've had a great reason to be in Oklahoma for over 140 years. I love this state. It's remarkable. Its people are unique and coveted. If we don't change the direction we're headed as a state, our grandchildren will leave this state. And, and here's why. So if you're going to break the law to have an illegal growth, and I'm not talking about, let me make this statement. There are at least 3,000 honest Oklahomans with grow operations, abiding by the rules, paying their taxes, legally doing it right. We have over 3,000 that are doing it wrong. They're breaking the law. Some of those are Oklahomans, but the vast majority of them are Chinese syndicated crime organization, two Mexican cartels, one Cuban cartel, and now a syndicated organized crime element from Eastern Europe that have come to Oklahoma. Why? Because we fail to enforce our laws on a statewide basis. If you do sampling of the marijuana consumed in New York City, over 40% of it is grown in Oklahoma. And that's ridiculous. I mean, we stop UPS wrap trucks, FedEx wrap trucks at the border where we have retrieved 7,000 pounds of marijuana. I mean, it's out of control. And so the legislature has empowered my office to stand up this crime task force. We've got, there's one person in the state of Oklahoma has the authority to issue a wiretap, me. And so we're utilizing those resources and partnering with the federal Homeland Security, ATF, FBI, uh, Secret Service, collaborating with Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics to not just kick in the door and shut down that one grow, but to collaborate and find out that one grow is affiliated with these 17 other illegal grows and simultaneously take them out and not just pull up their plants and put them in a pile, throw a cellarin on it and burn them, take their guns and their rifles and their cash and their cars, but to also take back the land now, give it to the sheriff to auction back to law-abiding, tax-paying 
members of Okmulgee County to repatriate the 200,000 acres in Oklahoma that are presently owned by Chinese nationals. So my objective over the next three and a half years is to reverse that, put it back, let our sheriff redesignate it, not, and not just that, then also trace the money through our wiretap capacity and our crypto security and cybersecurity and bring that money back in. And then work in, under memorandums of understanding with the sheriff and the police chiefs so that as they participate with us, then they get money back. So they have more money to hire better equipment and, and more robust staff. So that's a very important thing uh, to the AG's office and, and it's personally important to me because if any of my grandchildren leave the state because I failed, then I will have failed. Um, a third area that's very important to us, and, and you've, you've seen this in the media, um, I, I do believe strongly in transparency and accountability. I've been involved as a lawyer for 28 years in a fiduciary capacity with clients and answering to judges and, and prosecutors, and, uh, and we need to bring that back in Oklahoma at a statewide level. It's interesting, when we drafted our Constitution in 1906, we have you know, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive branch. And then we pulled back and we created two other offices that were absolutely independent. One's the auditor, who can audit any state agency with full power of every record, and the attorney general, who can hold everybody accountable at a statewide level. What we've not had over the last decade is an attorney general who's willing to do that. And it's time to do that. And so when I talk to my colleagues at state level offices, you know, they go, well, Drummond, what's your objective? You, you got us a little nervous because you're prosecuting a bunch of people. And like every morning you wake up and you decide you've got this new idea. I want you to answer, ask the question, how will Gettner respond? And if it's positive, then go do it. But if it's not, then there's probably a problem. And come see me and let's work it out. Let's figure it out how we can do that right. So we've got problems at a statewide level. <clears throat> you've, you've read recently the uh, GEAR Educational Relief Fund. Uh, we will more likely than not have to write a check to the federal government for $28 million. Because we got it and we did not deploy it appropriately. Now, were there criminal actions or were it just malfeasance and poor leadership at the Department of Education? We'll have to find out. We're investigating that. It's not against the law to make money. Epic, uh, its, its founders are being presently prosecuted by me to see if, in fact, they've broken laws in acquiring those hundreds of millions of dollars of profit or if they complied with the law. Similarly, with Swadley's Barbecue at the Tourism Department, did we as a state through tourism just fail with our contracts and not hold them accountable? Or did Mr. Swadley defraud us and take money that he shouldn't have taken? So it's these very difficult things that we're doing at a statewide level uh, at the AG's office such that every state actor, county actor, city actor, knows that they can pick up the phone and work with us and we'll help you find a path or not and do it behind a closed door with smoke-filled room that, that perturbs and, and frustrates the intent of the people because that's my objective is to take care of the people. Whenever I was in the Air Force, I knew that I was probably not a career pilot. Uh, over a, a, different a different opportunity, I'll give you some stories, but I was grounded seven times as a young fighter pilot for stupid stuff like flying inverted over Niagara Falls or flying below the rim of the Grand Canyon. And I just knew that I, I was that guy that grew up in the Osage and did things you know, the way we do it in the Osage. And, uh, but that, that quality that we have in Oklahoma uh, was that quality I reflected in the military. And I'm going to close with a little story. Um, first night of the Gulf War, there were four attack axes, and, and I got to lead one of them. Uh, so I had my F-15s and 48 fighter bombers behind me, and we crossed the border into Iraq at 3 a.m. and met with AAA and surface air missiles, MiGs launched against us. It was crazy. And we repelled all that and, and got into the strike zone and our fighter bombers dropped their bombs and my number three and four man led out and I stayed on target till the last one was done and then I followed as a rear guard. And about 100 miles to safety, uh, I was ordered to go back north and to engage with a, with what looked like a, a suicide fighter bomber coming down. And I found him at about 120 miles and they identified and the controller said, that's 
your target, you're cleared to kill. And as I ran that intercept, I decided in my cockpit that it wasn't a bad guy. I was at 35,000 feet, 1.2 Mach, I was King Kong, I'd shoot him at 40 miles and kill him at 25, and I delayed. And that delay let me catch up with the facts on the ground, and I'd concluded he was a good guy. So I ran that intercept, and at 25 miles, and 20 miles, and 18 miles, I was ordered to kill three different voices, each going up in rank, and I disobeyed three orders. Ran the intercept, ended up being a good guy. Brought him back, we landed at the same air base. He gave me a formal Saudi bow, he went east, I went west, it was a Saudi tornado pilot. And I pulled into my chocks, I was greeted by MPs, military police. That was appropriate, you know, first and out of the Gulf War, they should escort me in. And he said, they arrested me, handcuffed me. And uh, I thought, well, yeah, I disobeyed those orders. Yeah, that's serious. And so as I got escorted in, the pilot landed on the east side of the base and told his commander, who told his commander, came across the other side that Drummond had not killed a Saudi tornado pilot who coincidentally was a prince. Now, therefore, so, you know, they thought that was a good idea. And so as I walked in with, in handcuffs, I was met by a three-star general who awarded me the distinguished flag cross for basically disobeying three orders. And, uh, and, and it's that event and that personality that I bring to the office of attorney general, yes, I disobeyed some orders, but I did the right thing. And what my staff knows is what we do every, our objective, our moral compass is, we will do the right thing regardless of the cost. And you will see the opportunity out there that I sometimes cross swords with other state elected officials. They are great individuals with whom I have a great relationship, but just because they might be in a position of power doesn't mean they get a pass. We have to do the right thing and we have to work together. We're a small state. There's four million of us. There's that many people in Dallas, Fort Worth. So we have to pull together and be a team, whether you're native or non-native, whether you're Republican or Democrat, whether you're a farmer or a rancher or a businessman or a first responder, whether you're a public school teacher or a private school student. We are one state and we have to pull together. With that, I'm gonna close my remarks and answer some questions. Thank you. Questions for the Attorney General. Yeah. All right. <laughs> You've already answered uh, most of mine and I'll send you this stuff through email, sir. And, uh, but we appreciate you coming down. You've got a great show. Uh, I don't envy the position he has because he is trying his best to enforce all laws in the state of Oklahoma. And he's got, um, let, me, let me kind of just give you my philosophy. So we've been doing law enforcement in Oklahoma since before we were a state. Right? So we've been doing a long time, 120 years. Um, with the passage of McGirt, the Native American tribes have been doing law enforcement for four years. So we probably had some growing pains in 1906 and 7 and 8 and 9. And they've got some growing pains. And, and they may not fully appreciate the deficiencies that are out there that the sheriff sees clearly and the chief of police sees clearly. So we're going to work out those crinks and crunkles. And, and in the end, if we all row in the same direction, we're going to get there. But sheriff, I appreciate you. I have one. All right, we're going to go on. So, 780 was voted on by the citizens of Oklahoma, believing that it only dealt with medical marijuana. The attachments to that included things like decriminalize the possession of heroin. So, a healthcare provider or a child care worker could be in possession of heroin, and that possession of heroin would be nothing more than basically a traffic ticket. I believe if the people would have known what was attached to that bill, it never would have passed. In addition to those things, they also added an increase to what is petty larceny, up to $999. Is there anything we can do 
that could curve that portion of that. So hey, you, the two points you bring up were the two fails. We, we just failed. Um, so back up philosophically, appropriate criminal justice reform is always welcomed. Appropriate criminal justice reform. For example, you women, did you realize you're the most violent incarcerated of all 50 states? There is a higher percentage of Oklahoma women in prison than there are in Nicaragua. I mean, we are apparently a horrible lot of people. So, I, but I know our women, and, and they're not that bad, but we do have an issue. So we have a lot of women, highest incarceration rate in the, state, the United States, top one. So we've got issues we need to work with. So that opens up this narrative of responsible criminal justice reform. What happened is I think a lot of the people who voted in favor of 780 said, hey, marijuana, we don't need to put people, we don't, you know, if, if 780, if Governor Stitt had been arrested when he was smoking pot in college, which he's admitted, he would not be our governor today because it would have been a felony after a second arrest. Today, you can smoke and, you know, not have a card and it's a, a ticket, basically. The people of Oklahoma said that's fine. Um, but what happened in that schedule is we captured also some pretty tough drugs. And those tough drugs are not being predicates to felonies so that we can do some. So we have to fix that. And then the other thing, and I, I, so the convenience store operators, are there any convenience store guys in here? You talk to those guys, they were losing their mind. So back in the day, if you came in and you stole, you know, what was it, 500 bucks, 400 bucks, 500, you could spill up to 500, and it was a misdemeanor. Now they can steal 999. So, I mean, the, these criminals are not stupid. It's like, I don't need one TV, I need two TVs, right? And they're doing that. So all that's happening is the crime rate is going up on the petty larceny issue. So we've got these two absolute unintended consequences of 780. Then you throw into that the alleged savings were supposed to go toward mental health, but what happened is the Department of Corrections, and I, and I know Steve Hartman, he's a responsible, excellent administrator. He's like, Drummond, we've had 20 years of inadequate funding for our prison system, so it's supposed to be net back to mental health, and they're keeping it all because they're still trying to backfill all the delayed maintenance. So we've got a lot of issues that need to be addressed, and, then, and, and Chief, you bring up a great point. It, it absolutely frustrates city law enforcement of these two, because we've got a lot of heroin possession that's just a ticket, and we've got people stealing up to 999 and they're a misdemeanor, and we're not putting them in jail. So we have problems, so we have to fix those. And there's, I've encouraged, and the governor's initiated a, a, a task force to address criminal justice, and we're gonna get to the bottom of that and try to get some fixes. Great question. So after a, uh, after a facility is shut down, cleared out, bad people are taken away, you know, all the, all the stuff is collected. And I understand sending those collected funds for, for law enforcement, that's, that's important. But is there something in the, in, the, in the idea of a little bit of a cleanup? Yes. So we have a bonding requirement. In this, so we're talking about medical marijuana or mar marijuana grow facilities. If you have owned your land for greater than three years, you've probably, or five, five years, I, I'm sorry, three or five, I, I forget. You, you didn't just come in through Mexico from China, right? You've been here, you're an Oklahoman. So there's no bonding requirement for Oklahomans that have owned their land for a period of years and they then decide to grow marijuana, fine. But if you're a new person that's come in and just bought your land, you have to post a $50,000 bond. That $50,000 bond is if any, you guys are oil and gas operators, if you have a lease, if you have through the OCC or through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, you have to post a bond, right, for plugging costs. That's basically the concept. So these new buys for medical marijuana grow facilities post a $50,000 bond. How that will be then implemented, that doesn't kick in until November 1, but on, on November 1, when we then shut down the grow facility and use civil forfeiture to give it back to the sheriff to auction the land, we used the 50000 then to clean up and not just burn in place 
and I'm a rancher, and so you start burning any crop, especially marijuana, and it's going to run off into your creek, and it's going to where you put the accelerant, it's not going to grow again for another 20 years unless you bring in soil. So we've, we, what we've been doing is just creating an environmental problem. And you guys see it when you drive out rural Okmulgee County. These abandoned grow facilities are nice for them. So we're going to take the land, re-auction it, clean it up, give it back to the people. It's a great solution. If I don't do that, then don't ever vote for me again because I'm working on it. You've got some great law enforcement people. You've got a retired judge sitting right there who's been doing great work for a, a, a few minutes and uh, some great first responders and, and fire and, and uh, IMSA. You've, you've got great representation here. The community, the business community of uh, Henrietta and, and Southern Okmoge County is remarkable. Uh, you're great people. Um, I do want you to hold us accountable. We've been listening. We're going to be around for a little while before we run up the road to Okmoge. And uh, thank you so much for your attention and thank you for the invitation to be here today.